Good afternoon. My name's Aaron Cummings. I am just absolutely thrilled to be here at Strange Loop to uh, give a, a little talk about Voyager. Now, Voyager is a, uh, a pair of uh, twin space probes. These were launched back in uh, 1977. They're still out there returning uh, data from the, the very edges of our solar system, the beginnings of interstellar space. You can go out on JPL's uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory's webpage and, uh, and actually see where Voyager is um, right now. The, uh, the Voyager spacecraft have uh, thus far you know, completed their initial objective, which was to visit Jupiter and Saturn. The mission was then extended for Voyager 2 to visit Uranus and Neptune. And now 42 years after launch, they're still going, they still operate, we still get telemetry, they're still responding to commands. This is the longest mission, longest running mission that NASA has ever had. It's been running so long that it used to look like this. This was the, uh, this logo was brand new when Voyager launched. So in this talk, I'm gonna be speaking about the, the origins of the, uh, of the Voyager mission, what things enabled these missions to uh, succeed, and also what has been contributing to the longevity of these spacecraft and, uh, and what's coming next. This is really about engineering and systems and trade-offs. I'm not going to talk too much about the science of Voyager. Um, as far as why this talk, why talk about Voyager? Well, it's this. In the late 70s, early 80s, you see the pictures come in in newspapers of what Voyager is, uh, is showing us, and this is just incredible. I mean, this is what's really capturing the imagination. Um, about myself, I'm just a guy. My day job is programming and, uh, and electronics. I don't have any connection to NASA, nor to JPL, um, nor to the Voyager program, so I don't speak for them. Any opinions that might be in this uh, talk are, are mine and not those of NASA or JPL um, or my employer. So that out of the way, the beginning, 1964, an engineer at JPL, Gary Flandro, he had uh, proposed a, uh, a mission, a grand tour to the outer planets. And this was something that was enabled by an alignment of the four outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Not that they were in a straight line, but a, uh, a good position so that you could use a gravity assist maneuver around one to get you until the next. And this enabled you to get to Neptune in 12 years instead of, say, 30 if you had tried to go there uh, just in a straight shot. So I think the first thing we'll say is something about opportunity. If the planets literally align, you might want to take advantage of that situation. So let's build a deep space probe. We're in space because we want to learn about it. We need some instruments that are going to be on here. Um, we need some way to power those instruments. We need to get the data back from the probe, so we need a communication system. We need navigation, propulsion, stabilization, keep the thing pointed in the right direction. It needs to run for a decade or longer without having any maintenance. And we need to be able to control this thing in a non-real-time fashion because of the speed of light. The space probe's a long ways away. Light seems like it's really fast, but um, and I'm going to invoke Admiral Grace Hopper for this one. A way to visualize the speed of light is to uh, take something, a piece of wire, maybe this lanyard. This is about a foot long, you know, 30 centimeters or so. This is a nanosecond. And to get from here to Voyager is many, many nanoseconds on the order of um, 40 hours uh, uh, round trip to get to, uh, to Voyager 1 and, uh, and back these days. So there was a program put together at JPL to explore what it would take to have a, uh, a deep space probe, and they call this the Thermoelectric Outer Planets spacecraft, um, also known as TOPS. And this had a number of uh, novel technologies. One of them was the self-test and repair computer system, which this had you know, triple redundant components. There was a core that had quintuple five times redundancy and voting logic, you know, best two out of three in order to win in case the, there was a, a failure. 
and I guess if one of the computers lied, I, you'd, you'd vote it off of the spacecraft. <laughs> you also need some way to generate power. You're so far away from the sun that you can't build a solar panel and get it into space that's large enough to generate the hundreds of watts that you need. Chemical solutions, you know, fuel cells, um, might be okay for a short mission, but not for something lasting a decade. So you reach out to the United States Department of Energy, get something with a little more kick. Plutonium. It's glowing because it's hot. Plutonium-238 specifically, it's an alpha emitter, has about an 88-year half-life. It's a terrific heat source. You get about a half of a watt per gram on an ongoing basis, just spontaneously. And so you take this plutonium and you use that to create the MHW, the multi-hundred-watt radiothermolytic generator, which looks like this. I promise this is not a prop from Doctor Who. This is a picture of the actual um, RTG unit that was being used on Voyager. Inside, you have spheres of plutonium, which are then surrounded by a, a set of collectors. These are um, thermocouples. It's a solid-state device that can use a temperature differential um, and then take that temperature differential across the junction, turn that directly uh, into uh, direct current, into electricity. And Voyager had enough of these units, uh, three of them just like this, to power about 450 watts at launch. That ends up using 13 and a half kilograms of plutonium on top of a rocket. What could possibly go wrong? Well, there was an intensive safety program because nobody wants this thing to land on their house. Um, the probe needed to be able, the, uh, the RTG needs to be able to, uh, to survive uh, any sort of launch accident. Um, it also has a heat shield, so it will survive uh, re-entry uh, into the atmosphere. Um, and I just, I hope all that stuff really works in case something goes wrong with one of these one day. So the Grand Tour did manage to get a presidential endorsement President Nixon, in March of 1970, issued a statement on, uh, on space missions, and he said we should, exp um, should move ahead with the bold exploration of the outer planets. During the next decade, we will launch the Grand Tour missions to study the mysterious outer planets of the solar system, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and Pluto. Preparations for this program begin in 1972. Well, in December 1971, because of the cost of the Vietnam War, some other things that were happening at NASA budget-wise, uh, including the space shuttle program, which was just getting underway, the Grand Tour was scrubbed from NASA's, NASA's budget, which is the next lesson. The endorsement of the chief executive is no guarantee. That endorsement is sometimes not enough, and this could be the end of the story, except I'd have too long for questions. So. With, uh, with apologies to Paul Harvey, I will now give you the rest of the story. The Grand Tour was an ambitious um, and extremely expensive program, so the engineers came back um, and within 10 days, in 10 days, they then proposed a new reduced scope program, a simpler space probe relying on existing space-proven hardware and scope it back to only visit two planets, Jupiter and Saturn. And that was called the Mariner Jupiter Saturn 77 probe. I like to think of this as the MVP or the minimum viable probe, <laughs> which the key about this, it's cheap enough to get through Congress. So in May of 1972, funding is approved, and eventually the mission is renamed Voyager and the Voyager mission is then set to go for five years. That's the operational lifetime, the design lifetime of the Voyager spacecraft was five years. So it should have expired in 1982, here it is 2019. It's still running. How is that? Ron Draper was a um, systems engineer at JPL, and he had this concept called the, the X Factor, which was a, a pretty broad concept, which is effectively don't make any engineering choices that could limit the lifetime of the spacecraft. Don't make a choice that is going to limit later freedom of action. Or, as Donald Knuth would put it, premature optimization is the root of all evil. 
So the three R's of what make a spacecraft last for this long, first you have reliability. You need reliable components, tight design uh, and fabrication of the units, qualify whatever your sources are for, for components coming in and have a screening program. But sometimes the components still fail, so you need redundancy on these components. You have spares that are in your system to work around component failures. And the Voyager program had redundant computers, redundant navigation, redundant communication, redundant thrusters. You even had redundant spacecraft. You had Voyager 1, Voyager 2, on two separate trajectories with different risk profiles to them. The third R is reconfigurability. You want to be able to take advantage of the redundancy if you need it. And you can't anticipate everything in advance, of course. But once the thing is launched, you can't go out there and fix it. So you need some way to remotely reconfigure your spacecraft, maybe to do things that you hadn't anticipated in advance. Now, it's 1973. We're in the middle of the design of the, uh, of the Voyager probes. We hadn't been to Jupiter yet. And there was a surprise waiting for us there, which was uh, discovered by Pioneer 10. This is an earlier, simpler probe. It flew past Jupiter in December of 1973. And, um, and what Pioneer showed us was there were incredibly dense radiation belts, ionizing radiation around Jupiter, enough that it was going to endanger the spacecraft. Voyager's original design did not have any radiation hardening, so a program was then kicked off to add shielding, have very um, uh, careful selection of components, screening, qualification of those components to make sure they were relatively immune to radiation, and also intensive worst-case analysis of the circuits. Basically, you're allowing things to slow down you're trading off performance to have extra design margin in case you do take some, uh, some damage from the radiation. The project did keep on schedule, but it cost $150 million to do this radiation hardening. Um, fortunately, that got funded, and we kept on going, and we ended up with this. Here's the, the Voyager spacecraft all put together. There are 11 scientific instruments on here, plus your power, communications, navigation, propulsion systems, and there are three computer systems that, that tie all of this together. And the systems have these cryptic acronyms, CCS, AACS, and FDS, and I'll, I'll go through these um, each uh, one at a time. The command computer system, this system is always on, and this is really the system that's in charge. This is tied directly into the power system. It controls all the sequencing of all the major functions of the spacecraft. And those major functions are things like the power system, keeping the temperature inside, you know, not too hot, not too cold. Um, attitude and navigation commands are passed through um, the, uh, the CCS. Any instruments that need to be turned on or off, and also the configuration of the data system to return things um, through, back through the downlink, um, that's also uh, managed uh, through the CCS. This is an interrupt-driven machine. Um, it relies on timers, events that are coming from the other subsystems, and it will also respond to any commands that are coming uh, from, the, uh, from the uplink from mission control. The memory is kind of split into two pieces. About half of it is fixed procedures that typically don't change. Um, these are housekeeping items, uh, as well as any sort of fail-safes that are built in in case uh, there's lost communications and uh, it's not able to receive commands anymore. Um, now, this is all RAM, so everything is reconfigurable. There isn't anything that, that's hardwired um, into the system at all. Um, as far as the uplinked procedures, during a cruise, that's typically about once a month that you'd have something like that happen. During the planetary encounter, there's a lot more going on, and you might see this happen every 18, 24, maybe 30 hours that a, a new deck of procedures um, would get um, uploaded to, uh, to Voyager. Voyager also has autonomous fault detection. It has fixed procedures in place to detect and respond to, uh, to any failures that might happen. If something goes wrong, it starts swapping in those redundant components until things start to work right again. In fact, some folks have comp uh, compared the, uh, the CCS in Voyager to HAL. Um, fortunately for us, the CCS is not paranoid. 
And it's very good at listening to instructions. And it's also under no delusion that all of its circuits are functioning perfectly. So the hardware design of the CCS on Voyager, this is nearly identical to a previous design already proven in space um, that was used on the Viking orbiters uh, that were launched to Mars in, uh, in 1975. The computer, it's, uh, the, these computers, it's a dual redundant custom processor. This was designed at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And by redundancy, there's two logic units, there's two output units, there's two memories, there's two power supplies, there's, uh, there's two everything. And all of these systems can be cross-strapped to each other uh, in case of a failure. Architecture-wise, these, uh, these machines have 18-bit words. Those 18-bit words are split into a 6-bit opcode and a 12-bit address. It's a direct addressing machine. Any data is kept as 18-bit two's complement integers, and there are 13 registers, including you know, accumulator and program counter, and uh, there's a status register and so forth. Um, this is primarily driven by, by interrupts, and there are um, 32 interrupts that are available to, uh, to receive messages either from command systems um, or from other subsystems on the, uh, on the spacecraft. It's built with bipolar TTL logic. It has an 88 microsecond instruction cycle, so it's about 11,000 instructions per second. And memory access, in order to reduce the size of the bus and the, uh, the number of components on board, it takes um, four cycles, five cycles on this machine to get the data out of the memory because it only grabs things four bits at a time. The memory itself is made of, of what they call plated wire memory. It's in principle, a lot like a uh, magnetic core memory, except that there are no cores. It's actually a magnetic coating that's on wire. Um, the bits are stored on there as magnetic fields. It's non-volatile. Um, the reads are non-destructive. And it's largely immune to, uh, to radiation. It's not fast, but that's not really a design requirement um, for this. Programming on Voyager, this is a pretty raw environment. There's no operating system. I think it was all done in assembly language. There's a couple of references that talk about Fortran. I haven't been able to convince myself that um, the CCS was actually programmed in Fortran, um, but, but perhaps it was. The second system is the articulation and, uh, oh, sorry, the attitude and articulation control system. Um, this is a separate system. It's largely based on the same hardware as the, uh, as the CCS. This is the system that keeps the spacecraft pointed in the right direction and operates the, the instruments that are on the scan platform, this uh, you know, two-axis uh, arm that, that's hanging off the side which holds the, uh, the imaging instruments. The, uh, the CCS is really the what to do. The AACS handles the, uh, the how to do it as far as how to run the servos and how fast to move things, how to run the thrusters and so forth. The main job of the AACS is take that, that giant dish, that you know, three and a half, four meter dish on the front, keep that pointed back at Earth so we can keep communicating with this thing. The only time it doesn't do that is in case of a mid-course correction, or maybe they need to do something for imaging where the dish is in the way, and then it has to be able to get that pointed back so we can reestablish communications. Now, the AACS is also two redundant computers. Only one of them is going to be on at a time. Um, like I said, the hardware was the same as the CCS, except there was actually one more component. It was a piece of logic that was stuffed between the, the, the processor and the memory to give you indexed addressing modes, which then gave you the capability to reduce you know, some duplicate code that you, uh, that you might have on this, uh, on this processor. Um, this processor has a number of interesting peripherals to help it keep pointed and, you know, take the actions that it needs to do. Um, and it's actually quite a bit different from data systems that we might have had on, on previous probes. We used to do this just entirely with, with analog circuits. In Voyager, we had a digital computer that had a huge advantage because now you can change things after launch. If there's some sort of problem or you need to enhance the system, the capability is, uh, is there to, uh, to do that, including working around any of these, uh, if any of these peripherals fail, 
uh, you want to be able to program the machine um, or have it respond in order to, uh, to work around that. The third major system is the flight data system. This is what really manages the, the collection, formatting, transmission, and, uh, and storage of any data that's collected. And the data in this case is really three types. There's data that's coming from the instruments themselves. There's data related to, to imaging, which gives us those great pictures we get back. And then there's so-called engineering data, which is really about the health of the uh, spacecraft itself. Now, this machine was not like the other two. This was a brand new design. They needed something that was fast enough in order to handle the, the data volumes that they, that they were looking to uh, uh, process. Now, this was based on metal oxide semiconductors, CMOS. This was the first time that a CMOS computer uh, was going into space. This is a, um, a nibble serial, 16-bit word, 2.5 microsecond cycle time. It takes four cycles to do a fetch, then one more cycle to actually execute the instruction. So you get a cycle, a new instruction every 12 and a half microseconds, so that's 80,000 instructions per second that can be run on here. The memory is not plated wire memory, it's also um, CMOS memory um, in, this, uh, in this system. It's faster, but it's volatile, and it's really susceptible to, uh, to radiation. So as part of the radiation hardening process, there was just a ton of shielding, not literally a ton, but a lot of shielding put around this, uh, this system. Now, something I didn't know until I researched this is when Voyager's operating and it's going through its imaging and its measurements during an encounter, it's, retaining, it's returning most of that data through the downlink um, in real time. Because the amount of storage on Voyager is so limited, you really want to be able to grab everything just as things are being measured and get that right away. Now, this means that there's no retry, which means you can't really tolerate a whole lot of errors. But you're talking about something that's a really long ways away. It's a noisy channel, and you need to have some way in order to um, insulate yourself against uh, errors that are, that are coming in because of, uh, of noise or whatever. And so there is a form of forward error correction um, it's called Golay encoding. This is basically a, uh, a type of parity that's being done. Every 12 bits of data are then tacked together with 12 bits of parity. This gives you the capability in each of those 12-bit blocks to recover from any three bits having been flipped. Uh, and that was able to, uh, to raise the uh, reliability of the, uh, the transmission, get the error rate low enough to, uh, to an acceptable level. Uh, but there is a penalty for that, which is you double the amount of data that you need to, uh, to send down, but there is a trade-off statistically that you, then you, can, you can then run a, a faster um, data rate because the, uh, the, the total error rate is going to be uh, sufficiently lower. Now, sometimes you need to record things, and they get recorded on tape. Not that tape. It was an 8-track tape. Not that 8-track tape. It was this 8-track tape. So Voyager has this tape drive in it. If for some reason it can't relay the data live streamed, what it's going to do instead is dump that data to the tape. It might be because of something that they had to do for imaging. Maybe you're behind a moon or a planet. Um, this tape, it's about 1,000 feet long, holds 500 megabits. That's enough for about 100 full resolution images uh, from the imaging system on Voyager. And then the tape is rewound and played back for uh, when we're back in contact with the ground stations again. Voyager Zero. Turns out there's actually three spacecraft built, not just two. The first one that was delivered was an engineering prototype. And if you want to go see that, it's now in the National Air and Space Museum. The, uh, this engineering prototype was uh, especially handy when you are trying to you know, troubleshoot um, between, you know, three systems. There's, I mean, there aren't very many of these. You can't go to Stack Overflow and, you know, ask what's going on with it. Um, so you're able to troubleshoot by, well, how is it working in the other system? And this actually happened several times in the, you know, couple of month period leading up to the launch after these, uh, the spacecraft had been, uh, had been shipped. So we're finally at launch. Design's all done. Voyager 2 launches first. August 20th, 1977. A couple of weeks later, Voyager 1 launches. That's September 5th of 1977. Voyager 1 is on a faster path, and so it's going to get to Jupiter first. 
Now, post-launch, there were some issues at Jet Propulsion Laboratory in managing the mission. Um, there was an incident where, and I think it was because engineers were being assigned to other tasks, getting uh, distracted by work going on in the Galileo program, which was a follow-on to Voyager. There was a command that was supposed to get sent to Voyager 2, because you need to talk to it every week, and somebody forgot to send that command. So the autonomous fault protection on the uh, spacecraft said, well, I haven't heard from ground in a while. Uh, I timed out at 168 hours. Let's switch to the other receiver. Something must have gone wrong. It runs the, uh, the lost command routine. So it switches to the secondary receiver. Secondary receiver, power it up. There's a shorted capacitor in the phased lock loop of this receiver. The receiver still works, but not very well. It doesn't track frequencies very well anymore. So a command is then sent up to Voyager to switch back to the primary receiver. That receiver runs for 17 minutes, experiences a short in the power supply, blows the fuses, dead. Now you need to wait another 168 hours to get the spacecraft to listen to you again after the lost command procedure runs a second time, switches back to the secondary receiver. We're still running on this receiver that doesn't listen very well. Um, it's very sensitive to temperature on the spacecraft and Doppler shift and so forth. Um, so the um, folks at the Deep Space Network with the giant satellite dishes that are used to talk to these probes, they have a, uh, uh, they have a procedure by which they sweep through a series of frequencies to try to figure out which one Voyager 2 is listening on the, uh, listening on the best. So I think the lesson here is don't neglect your project after the launch. I think this had been sort of a wake-up call to the, to the management at JPL. The project did get back on track, and so by the time we got the Jupiter, um, things were really in much better shape. And so Jupiter, Saturn, the moon Titan for, for Voyager 1, all of those encounters went great, um, likewise for Voyager 2. After the Titan encounter, Voyager 1 was sent north out of the ecliptic. It's not going to ever encounter another plant in, planet in our solar system. Voyager 2, though, based on the success of the program thus far, they managed to get more funding, and that kept going on to uh, Uranus and Neptune. But there's an impending problem as you're approaching Uranus is the further you get away, the weaker the signal gets. The weaker the signal is, the less bandwidth that you have. You only have one chance to capture this data, too, because you don't have any storage to speak of on the spacecraft. So if you want to get all the pictures that you want and all the other data, um, you know, scientific data, you need to have some way to augment the, um, the, uh, the bandwidth of that. And so what was done there was to implement a data compression algorithm. This was not part of the original design at all. Um, this is used for compressing the images. Ordinarily, that flight data system, only one of those systems would be running. Now we're using both of them in parallel, one to process the, um, the uh, uh, general science data, and the other one is now processing the, the image data and compressing it. You get about a two-to-one ratio of compression out of that. And they also kicked into there a Reed Solomon encoder, which is a, a different type of forward error correction system. Uh, Reed Solomon has less of an overhead uh, compared to, uh, to Golay. It's about a 15% overhead of bits. Um, but again, that was able to give reliable enough communications to get enough images, enough data um, off of the uh, spacecraft. Now, as this is getting further and further away from us, um, what we're finding is uh, Voyager. We're getting, you know, it's, it's tougher and tougher to, to communicate with it. Um, but uh, we're able to adjust data rates and, uh, and keep that going, of course. The um, hydrazine fuel that's used for the, uh, for the thrusters, there's enough of that to last for probably a couple of more decades. But really what's going to be the limiting factor on this probe is power. The radiothermolytic generator is suffering two effects. One of them is the, um, just the, the half-life of the plutonium. Um, we're, you know, halfway through the first half-life of that plutonium at this point. 
But the other thing that happens is those, uh, those thermal couples do eventually degrade and you get less power out of those thermal couples. So what we've been able to do is keep things running by turning off instruments, turning heaters on and off uh, in order to try to you know, modulate the amount of power that we have in the, uh, in the spacecraft. And I mean, really estimates are we're only going to be able to operate this um, probably for about the next five years or so. At which point the spacecraft will fall silent, but they've already reached solar escape velocity, so they're not coming back. They're going to keep going out into the great beyond, maybe land someplace, somewhere out in the galaxy. And on Voyager is this golden record. This is a recording of um, images and sounds and greetings um, from the Earth. Who knows, this might get found one of these days and, and somebody will you know, decode this and have themselves a little message uh, from, here, uh, from us here on Earth. So, that's my talk. Um, I have a couple of minutes for, uh, for questions, um, so uh, go ahead and shoot. Thank you. Go ahead. Can you say anything about the specs of the camera? Uh, okay, the specs of the camera. Um, this was a camera that was based on a uh, Viticon tube, which uh, is, a, is a vacuum tube based camera. It was something that would have been uh, in regular television cameras back in the, say, the 60s or, or 70s in that era. This was before um, digital sensors really became uh, widely available. Um, it's able to, uh, it's, a, it's a square frame, 800 by 800 pixels, and so you get a 640 megapixel image. Um, eight levels of gray, there wasn't any color capability um, native to the tube itself. Instead, there was a color wheel that was in front of the camera that would cycle through. I think they had eight different filters, um, colors, plus also some things for like uh, methane to try to do some imaging there. Uh, right there. How much has the redundancy of the logic circuit been used? Are there, there are CPU that just died and they had to replace them with another two or seconds? Um, I, I haven't, uh, the question was about how much has the redundancy of the computers been used. I, I think really, thankfully, not very much. Uh, I'm not aware of a computer system having completely rolled over. Um, there, there have been some issues with single-bit failures in some of the, uh, some of the CMOS memories on the uh, flight data system. I, I know that they have been doing some programming to, uh, to try to work around those single-bit failures. Um, but as far as a complete wipeout, I, I'm not aware of one. Uh, right here. Do you know how big the team is that's currently working with it? Okay, the question was about the, the team uh, currently working on Voyager. I, I did see one number, um, and this, this number is actually a couple of years old. I think it was about 14 people working on Voyager. I'm, I'm not sure if that includes the support from the, uh, from the Deep Space Network who's running all the communications, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a pretty small team these days. Uh, back there. Okay, the, uh, that question was, um, are we expecting the, uh, uh, the, the communications to fail or the hardware to fail? Uh, as far as the communications goes, um, the flight data system is really configurable to um, run at lower and lower data rates. So I think we are able to at least keep getting things back. Um, there really isn't any more high-speed data coming back from Voyager because the, uh, the imaging platform was turned off, you know, 30 years ago. Um, I, I think the, the one unit that everybody is watching and trying to manage is the, uh, is the radio thermolytic generator and the, uh, the power systems. Uh, right here. Um, I had that on the first slide, actually. Uh, can I get back there? Um, you know what, I'm not going to look it up. I think it's around 40 hours. Uh, right there. Do you know anything about the, uh, the process for writing and testing code for the updates that are sent? 
I wasn't able to get a lot of information on that. I, I do know that they have prototype systems uh, in the lab, basically a copy of, of all of these systems. Um, but as far as like a, you know, a software engineering approach, there, there wasn't a whole lot that I could find that was, uh, that was written on that, unfortunately. Right there. Okay, um, so the, uh, the, the original mission, and, and of course these are about $1970, uh, was somewhere between $750 and $900 million. The, uh, the reduced mission um, was originally funded for, it was around $250 million. Uh, as far as affecting the hardware, it meant that things like the, uh, the Star computer, which the engineers thought was a really elegant solution, that ended up getting thrown overboard, and then they ended up using you know, other hardware that they, that they originally had. Um, I think the ultimate cost of the program eventually grew because the, the program had been extended, and it probably cost around $900 million by the time that we you know, get to now um, anyway. Um, I mean, a question about you know, extending you know, the, the, the Grand Tour. I mean, Uranus and Neptune... Voyager 2 went there. We haven't been back since. Uh, I think the, the other really deep space mission, you know, a couple of years ago, um, New Horizons uh, visited uh, Pluto, and, you know, that was, that was something uh, just really, you know, terrific to watch because it was sort of like the, the, the rebirth of getting something that you could never otherwise get. Um, but uh, uh, I, I get your question sufficiently? Okay, thanks. Uh, right there. I should. I haven't put it together yet, um, but I'll try to get that posted on my GitHub. Oh, oh. <laughs> um, I, I have a stack of things I've printed out like this. Uh, I just need to get all the URLs posted. Uh, I got a couple more right here. What's the physical failure mode of the thermocouples? What's the limiting component there? You, uh, okay, this was a uh, question about physical failure mode of the thermocouples. I, I, I didn't try to unwind the semiconductor physics um, behind that, unfortunately, so I, uh, I, I don't understand that one yet. Okay. Uh, right here. Um, I think it's about every couple of months. This is the frequency of the, uh, the maintenance updates to, uh, to Voyager. Um, there, there's not a whole lot of maintenance to do because, um, I mean, the, the, the measurements are sort of ongoing and they're, they're pretty static. Uh, it's really any management that they want to do of the power system, um, but I think it's every couple, three months that they're doing an uplink. Oh, there's one over there. Uh, okay, uh, are there alternatives to an RTG um, something that's going to last a couple of decades um, and provide this amount of power for something that's that far away from the sun, um, I, I don't think there is one. As, uh, I mean, even in missions that we're launching now, um, Cassini and New Horizons, uh, they were also using RTGs. So, uh, unfortunately, I don't think there's a better alternative yet. Uh, right here. Yes. Um, the question was uh, time division on the deep space network. Um, I, I, I do know that they do have a, a schedule. I mean, the team working on Voyager, I imagine that part of their job is managing the sequencing of when data is going to be transmitted back. And so I'm, I'm sure that those resources are, are managed. Um, but I, I, I do know that they can't just sit there and, and listen to it um, all the time. Uh, one more quick one uh, right here. Do you know if there's any security on the data coming back and forth? Or is it just whoever has a big antenna can talk to you? Yeah, security. I could find no information about the security, which either means there isn't any or it's classified. I'm not sure which. <laughs> okay, uh, my time's up. Um, this is great.
Thank you very much.